query on 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 the chat GPT, and I was surprised how how good of a quality, but assuring good quality it comes out, right? So in the even, I'm Martin Rosowski. I've been here in the Valley for 35 years, doing all kinds of different things, uh, doing building the startups uh, and and uh, you know some success, some some failures, but but overall fantastic life and then. And then, and, and I'm, I have a today pleasure of of introducing the uh, the great panel talking about the deep tech, and and then I I would like to introduce the panel, and starting with with uh, Darwin and just I, I think that we we can share the microphone okay. the the other one, and then so we kind of rove around because the the only person that is not here is Carvey, and then we can we can do him last because he's remote right behind us okay so darwin please sure hi at the uh, hi everyone uh, my name is darwin Lang. i'm the founder and general partner of uh, good ai capital uh, good AI, ai capital is a venture fund we focus on early stage ai companies with particular interest in healthcare fintech Robotic automation, enterprise software, software as a services, anything that focuses the productivity and improve, kind of like allowing that uh, great improvement. And this is something that we very, very interested in. So we have a very interesting name. We call ourselves the Good AI Capital. We focus on that stems from our basically our mission-driven investment thesis. We want to partner with entrepreneurs who have a deep desire. Basically, we have this uh, kind of mission that's that doing good by doing, doing well by doing good. So we partner with uh, all the entrepreneurs and founders uh, who have a deep desire to use uh, technologies, in this case, it's AI, to um, tackle some of the most challenging problems faced across different industries. So uh, some of you may ask, so that sounds like a lot about ESG investment. And for those, I'm sure a lot of them are uh, familiar with the term, which is stands for environmental uh, sustainability, social responsibility, and corporate governance. So, um, tend to people tend to look at it as a um, kind of just asset based, asset class investment. So, the way we treat it is we look at it as a set of values. This is something that um, kind of defines us, and we also kind of characterize the entrepreneurs. They have to believe a strong mission, strong values, and this is how we run the fund, and this is how we want to invest in uh, entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. So, we're moving over to Nardo. Uh, Manolato, Manolato. Yeah, is that proper? Manolato. Manolato. Okay. Yes. So uh, I, I'm Nardo Manolato. I'm the managing partner for Qubits Ventures. So Qubits Ventures is a uh, venture fund investing in early stage quantum technology companies. So I'm not sure if a lot of people know what the term quantum means, right? So uh, this fund is a um, is sector agnostic. And it's looking, it's looking anywhere from a perspective of applications, system software, uh, picks and shovels and chips and everything that kind of makes up what a quantum computer looks like, uh, including uh, anywhere from hybrid technologies as well. So uh, I'm the only quantum fund in the US. And uh, in this area is, I think, something that need, you need to watch out for. Uh, the space of quantum Think of it as a macro technology that would impact all of the different technologies that you have, including AI in the big part, and also all of the different industries that you have, uh, that you're, you care about. Manufacturing, healthcare, life sciences, energy, <laughs> and all of that stuff. Great. Thank you. And then uh, we move remote to, to Carney uh, Ronson. And, okay. and where, are you, where are you based now? I'm down in Southern California. Where? Southern, Southern California. California. Southern California, yeah, there we go. Yeah, didn't hear it. Good, please. Uh, hi, everybody, Kerry Ransom. I uh, have a, a few different hats I wear, uh, primarily here to talk about uh, Operate, which is a venture studio I started uh, a few years ago and partner with early stage founders to help them get off the ground, uh, primarily in software-based businesses with a heavy focus on data, which leads to things like machine learning and AI and other potential when done uh, effectively. Uh, have spent most of my life building companies, have done eight startups. Uh, so actually started my ninth company, co-founded last year. And then I also manage a fund comprised of just over 100 community banks around the country where we do strategic investing into 
um, compelling bank technologies. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you very much. And then um, to, to begin with, let, let's kind of get and figure it out what the whole deep tech terminology means, right? Because if you if you type in GT, uh, Ch Ch G G GTP, uh, you you will have a nice write up of what that is, and Wikipedia has another definition, right? So so in general, from the point of view of the investors, it's 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 basically a, a set of barriers that one is creating to to enable the company that has a certain IP to prohibit other ones to 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 replicate that idea very quickly, right? So whether that's AI or, or some kind of a complicated, even logistical issue of how to make things happen, it, it still qualifies as a, as a deep tech, right? But, but I think because of our panel, and then there's so much going on right now and uh, in, in the terms of the excitement of, of what, what's happening in AI finally, right? Because just, just like, let's say four, four years ago, if you came into the to the VC and then you were p pitching anything AI, you probably got a boot like right away because anything AI was not very popular because, you know, it's just an algorithm and there was no proof in the pudding that any, any of that stuff worked. Now with the G GPT and sorry, I, I mean, it's, it's a new term for me. So I'm probably going to reverse the, the lettering uh, and then seeing something that really works that's super exciting. So with all the fiascos that, that, that the valley is surrounded with, I think the uh, AI is the hardest thing. So therefore, I think that it will be kind of nice today to, to focus on deep tech relating into the AI, if we could agree uh, with it. And, and, and I, I would like to ask you, Darwin, first, to tell me like what's going on in, in this exciting world, right? I mean, yeah. now you, you kind of elevate it. Uh, you. from from where, where you were probably four years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with that. So I think this kind of the past month or the end of last year, kind of just the scene of AI kind of like exploded. And, and you know, just I think partly just because of the whole chat GPT kind of just break every single barrier. Um, and more importantly, is because the this hugely powerful tool that is basically making being made access to the whole world. People can see it, witness the first kind of like, you know, how it works now. So, you know, we talked about how, how to do drug development or healthcare and all that. That's great, mm -hmm. you know, um, but seems like the rich is just exploded because of this. So this is something where really, really kind of like put AI back into the map, if you will. Um, and part of it is, I think this is a kind of category that's called generative AI. So in case you're not familiar with it, you know, ChatGPT is just one of the many tools that just came about. So the idea is that, you know, you've used it. So basically it's like, you know, we can put a short prompt, you know, say, write me an essay, you know, that's describe a child having lunchtime, you know, as if he was uh, actually a fourth grader. And actually ChatGPT just go ahead and create this essays, you know, flawlessly. Um, they can pretend to write as a fourth grader. So that intelligence uh, basically create this kind of like this intelligent output that cannot be never really can hasn't been seen by a lot of a lot of us before. So and there are other tools that actually allow you to generate video, you can generate graphics, and all kinds of very very great innovations. So um, I think the idea behind it is really like um, now the big of threat is like. Not, not only you can see this is actually AI at work now, and people can think actually they can they get the value directly out of mm -hmm. it. And of course, there's also like all kinds of issues. People say, well, what if, you know, how do I, you know, the kids no longer learn how to write math, do math and all that stuff. So all kinds of questions kind of come about, but just kind of, again, capture people's imagination again. Um, you know, the whole point about technology and power, power behind it. And, you know, I think the... Not because of that, I think you know, I'm sure everybody kind of just see that the whole idea about the chat GPD, who is the most afraid right now? Google is the number one that's being threatened right now because now right. you don't have to go to type in a search box to say, give me the greatest locations, how to cook a meal, you know, because Google will just return you a bunch of links 
But ChatGPT will just like actually create the entire recipes, tell you a guy in San Francisco for the next three days, which restaurant you want to go to, whether you eat, they create a good job in creating an understandable format that basically say, um, it could be a Google killer. So yeah. this is Google is really afraid. So yeah, no, I, I I would be afraid when if I were Alphabet right right now <laughs> for sure. Yeah, Nardo? Yeah, I I think so. The advent of big data, we generate so much data, right? So the problem that we have in classical computing is one is Moore's law is about to be broken here, right? So the classical architecture where you're doing a lot of deterministic computing type of uh, uh, approaches, uh, we are close to nearing the, uh, the the gate, the transistor gate sizes to be so small that e electrons can actually pass through it. So once you break that, then th the problem is, okay, that kind of chip architecture uh, would uh, would be the threshold for the kind of like the ceiling for a lot of these AI and big data stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The right. So so the the other part of it is uh, you need a new kind of computing approach because AI is very a uh, it's a probabilistic type of uh, a problem, right? So it solves things in probabilities, and classical systems are not really made for that. So quantum systems, the quantum computing technology is made for that just because of uh, quantum properties that you have, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, over time, you're going to see the combination of quantum and AI. If you were impressed with ChatGPT now, mm -hmm. get it, give it a few years when quantum intersects that. And I think you'll see a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, I, I just want to ask you because I, I've seen a lot of companies actually in the Valley trying to, to get and, and build and, you know, a lot of alphabet. Mm -hmm. bets are on on the quantum quantum computing and 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 then that that line of of actually delivering the goods it's kind of shifting right i mean it's, it's moving uh and and how far are we from you think from quantum computing to to be a reality in your opinion yeah i i think you have to look at it in stages right so the world that we're going to live in is not going to be pure quantum computing because the pure quantum computing is going to be a little bit farther right so the world that we're living in now is more what, what i call the hybrid approach right okay. you have solutions now that are basically using the combination of classical ai and quantum machine learning mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction working together Right, because quantum machine learning is good for really end hard problems, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, classical AI are good for a certain set of problems. So the combination of those two is probably going to be the real world. Right, uh, where things are going to be going forward is you're going to have the CPU, the GPU, the QPU all working together mm -hmm. to solve uh, a, a really big problem in the AI uh, side of things. So from a perspective of uh, quantum being usable, it's usable now. Mm -hmm. You have two, uh, D-Wave annealer has 250 different use cases, uh, doing a lot of optimization and simulation type of problem solving. And that's happening now. And we have lots of, we have uh, production use cases uh, in this space already. So unless you know it, mm -hmm. you don't get to see it. So sorry, I'm from the audience. Yep. So talking about quantum crypto, yeah. Yeah. There's so, so there's <laughs> uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff happening in what we call uh, trying to create quantum resilience uh, type solution. Right. Uh, it is a big deal for the Feds now. So uh, somebody had mentioned in the prior panel, uh, the, there is the uh, Quantum uh, Preparedness Act that's been signed by Biden a few days ago. So we are we are on the hook. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the feds are on the hook in trying to make sure that we are prepared to create quantum resilience in our networks, including our, you know, uh, our networks, our uh, blockchains, our Web3, our crypto, because we are, from a perspective of breaking RSA encryption, we are about seven to nine years away. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. The, the, so so that, that window is really coming close yep. to... Yep. To reality, right? So, correct. And the some of the things that are coming out there are things like, okay, uh, you have China claiming they're already, you know, making progress in breaking some of this uh, uh, early state, uh, breaking the cryptography that we have now, based on uh, 347 number of qubits. IBM just came out with 433 qubits quantum computer uh, just probably about a month ago. 
So now you're looking at that. So, okay, now we have to validate that claim, right? So I'm seeing startups that are doing quantum resilient blockchain, quantum resilient blo um, uh, crypto, and layering that kind of stuff, post-quantum cryptography, quantum random number generation, QKD, space communication. All that stuff is a big focus for the government at this point. Well, thank you so much. I, I wanted to to actually talk a little bit to... Do you hear me? Or oh, maybe, maybe I can use the mic. I, uh, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, so Carney, uh, you, you're you're this entrepreneur and done a number of companies now. Now you're doing the Venture Studio. What What's going on between you and the deep tech, right? Because it doesn't have to be AI or quantum computing. So I want you to tell, tell us a little bit about your experience in this building up the barriers of entry uh, called deep tech. If, if yeah, I mean, I think... Moderate. Yeah, I mean, just to build upon what the other uh, panelists are, are talking about, I think in some cases where we will look at it is at that uh, application level. How do you incorporate a capability like this, like uh, large language models and what OpenAI is developing? And then do you put it into an application that fits in uh, like, like a vertical markets workflow? You know, you're you're trying to help people that maybe are creating a, a ton of content in a vertical case to not have to actually keep cranking it out all the time and you can leverage what is available in something like chat gpt but you're also leveraging the the unique information that's available uh, in that industry to complement it and so i think that's where you're going to start to see a lot of derivative uses and where this gets applied and starts to actually be in the hands of humans who are uh, being unlocked to, to focus more of their attention on the work where they can uniquely add value and uh, not have to do the rote routine things, which has kind of been the promise of a lot of machine learning and, and AI for a long time. And I think we're finally starting to see where it can actually be applied. And, and I think that's exciting. Uh, and so those are the opportunities I, I talk a lot about, you know, with, as spending most of my career in software, a lot of it hasn't been very intelligent. And I think we're now starting to see what an intelligent system can actually do to make uh, life as a business person that much more enjoyable and freed up to focus on the highest value activities. And so I, I say a lot, we're going to see a lot of software getting replaced over the next decade that might be 20, 30, even in the last five to 10 years old, uh, that is gonna be replaced by much smarter systems that will be to the benefit of everyone. Well, thanks so much. Um, I just, since we're here during the JP Morgan, like a big, big healthcare, healthcare conference, and I think it will be a good, good subject to talk about uh, a little bit of of what's what's going on in 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 healthcare and the application of of the AI that that we're getting, uh, the new tools that that we've learning. And so I I wanted to ask Darwin if there is any significant uh, innovations that you know of in the AI and healthcare. You know that 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 is worth to tell us. Sure. So I think uh, one of the kind of current buzzword in healthcare is called precision medicine. So for, for those who are not, thank you. For those who are not familiar with the idea called precision medicine, basically it's the idea where you can actually gather data sources, you know, patients data from their um, MRI, the genomics data, or kind of also their EKG data and all that. And how do we kind of use that and drive what we call a predictive model in a sense that where, you know, that predictive, the outcome of that predictive model will be kind of like a personalized treatment, for example, for a patient. So, um, you know, it's also the term personal, uh, precision medicine is also called pre, uh, personalized medicine. And by that meaning that treatment or that, you know, kind of like a prescription is geared towards this single patient as opposed to this one drug that is applied to everybody in the population. So that's a very hot topic. 
And that kind of really leads to the whole point behind AI. So a lot of these, um, um, there's a lot of applications that are existing right now. Um, for example, you can actually use a AI to use look at an MRI, to look at potentially a cancer detection, early detection for cancer, or potentially where you could look at some of the, um, the electronic health records for patients, you know, basically look at, okay, this is the, this is the drug intake for the last five months and all that. What is the potential uh, outcome? And for that, you know, kind of this, this is what we call a lot of siloed applications, if you will. Um, these are all great. These are all interesting. Um, but what we see is actually more interesting is that how can we kind of combine all these different data together and create a holistic, you know, platform and then use a curated model, which is, you know, this AI model, you can actually prescribe and link, let's say I can link to the uh, MRI images for a patient with their health records, and then kind of correlate all that information and build like this, you know, again, a more powerful personalized treatment machine towards, you know, the, the, the patient. So one, one of the, you know, interesting thing, of course, is that, um, you know, as a doctor, you know, I would like to, you know, basically, there's a lot of different ways we can go about treating a patient. Mm -hmm. And how can we look at all these different data across the board, um, of course, with AI that help them to do that, you know, potential prescription, that would be a much more powerful way just to look at the MRI data itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, and another, you know, for a consumer level, I think, you know, we talked a lot about some of the telehealth uh, kind of platform. Um, you know, we have this, you know, we can do actually what more powerful is that, like, say, have a mobile app, for example, for an individual patient or person, basically, who has diabetes. Now, you know, we're actually in integrating the data, not only they're just blood pressure data or whatever, you can actually potentially integrate other data from the, even data from their um, potential um, Apple Watch, you know, because the Apple Watch is collecting all the EKG data. How can we integrate all that? and create, you know, sort of like a platform to manage the diabetes patients. So in a way, it's much more powerful than just say, single looking at one single single source of data. So that's actually one of the most exciting things that we're looking at right now. Yeah, well, but the, the, isn't the HIPAA like prohibiting the data share? Like, isn't that a big yeah. obstacle right now? Because, you know, I, I understand like in China or whatever, you you know, you don't have those barriers, right? You you just like get collect the data and then and then whoever needs to get yeah. an access in a meaningful way doesn't have to worry about uh, a number of, of legal aspects of, yeah. of deeping into the data. I'm not sure if doctors can use the Apple Watch data and I've also been told by other ventures that are running me that depending on where you place the device, it has different readings of the Apple Yep. Right, right. So so anyways. Like accessing that data is probably the biggest yeah. challenge for you, yeah. right? Uh, in in the essence of of the um, of the. But I guess that's actually an opportunity, also. But I can address that. Yeah, well, that's fine. Right. <laughs> well, that's I mean, even just some of the engines that are producing things like synthetic data uh, around yes. this have been really additive uh, as as part of that. Yeah, I was actually thinking about it. Is is that uh, distinguishing a true data? The the you know it, it's it's like in the quantum computing, you're chasing that little electron somewhere, and and then and then looking at syllabizations uh, back into the let's say uh, Egyptians that left us a be beautiful pyramids, right? We don't know how they build it, and and then I'm thinking that you know if if you have some kind of a skewed uh, data point of view on a certain things, then then you can screw up the entire way of thinking, right? So how how do you deal with this in the let's say uh, of of figuring out like both like how do you distinguish the good data with the bad, bad data? Uh, Nara. Yeah, I, I think a, a big part of the data pipeline is in the curation side, right? Because the, the curation, actually, there are now products out there that looks into the truthfulness of the data based on how it's used mm -hmm. uh, and how it's curated and where it's sourced from, right? Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, provenance from a data perspective. Uh, there's a There are uh, products out there that combines blockchain and healthcare data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's all, there are a lot of distributed data management system that basically spiders out data from a federated perspective, and those are also blockchain enabled. So you're seeing companies like that. Well, the, but, but blockchain, you know, it's just like on the internet. If it, it's on the internet, it must be true. 
if it's on the blockchain, it doesn't necessarily miss. Co yeah, correct, true, but, right. the, but the source, right? So the concept of curation, uh, actually there is a scoring method from the truthfulness perspective of it okay. based on how much it's being used, right? Okay. Um, so things like when Marty says, okay, well, Apple data, you know, that that's not necessarily useful because it may not be a clinical grade system and you're trying to do clinical diagnosis, right? So things like that are graded from a curation perspective mm -hmm. uh, based on truthfulness and usability. And uh, there are people that are actually grading those things. Yeah, and no, I noticed that that a lot of new devices, IoT devices that are getting the, into the business of, of, of getting into the like little bit of a, uh regular diagnost not diagnostics but but just like tell you the blood pressure this that, and whatever uh they're coming in the aura ring and none of them are really wanted to get into the business of of being a medical device uh because of that issue is 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 just such a huge liability for them yeah and i think you have to when when you look at that, so a, a new class of things that you need to look at is uh if there's a lot of interest in wearables and medical devices, but one thing that you need to look at is the next generation of sensors are coming to be quantum enabled. So quantum sensors are the, a, a nearer term uh, quantum implementation, right? So quantum sensors are basically looking at quantum effects. Mm -hmm. uh, one startup I'm looking at right now, you know, they're looking at the EEG. They have a, a, a quantum magnetometer that mm -hmm. is 1,000 times more sensitive than the existing quantum sensors that we have. So, I mean, if you can track a single neuronal spark that goes across your brain and look at the bottlenecks in your brain uh, synapse, right, mm -hmm. then you could diagnose a whole bunch of stuff. But if you look at the amount of de generated data for that, mm -hmm. nobody knows what that truth is yet, right? Uh, so another one would be a quantum sensor looking into uh, looking into uh, particle movement inside of your body, mm -hmm. right? So they can they can actually hone in and say, you know let's say a, a drug particle going in your body and see where it's going for looking at it from an efficacy perspective. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to translate that yet, right? right? right. So things like that. So we have about ten minutes left. I do have a question. So you know, my big concern about so I'm a, I'm a when it comes to philosophy, I'm really about something called agency, which is, um, so, uh, you know, as a country, you know, it's all about people make their own decisions, and hopefully they gather information that's meaningful, etc. And, you know, for years, AI has been used by corporations versus individuals. So it's, it's being used primarily to sell versus to help individuals make better decisions. I mean, there's like a, it, you know, it, it, it always comes back to information asymmetry, right? And so my concern is, you know, it seems like AI moves quicker and quicker into this, you know, uh, theft of agency where where you've got, I don't know if you've read Chomsky's book on manufacturing consent, but, you know, AI can make stuff up on the internet and manufacture consent. I mean, there's robots on the internet, on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so how do you get it so that AI, I mean, number one, are you guys concerned about that at all? And I mean, you've got deep fake videos, deep fake uh audio are you are you guys concerned at all about that and if you are like how do you guard against that um you know for for different individuals and what technology is out there to address it uh, i can take it right so i think this is uh kind of like you know the always this dark side of the ai where you know one interesting thing is um there is this uh, chat GPT and actually it was, has an answer to that. It's like, well, you know, one, one question, one person asked that, um, can you, why are you so good at making all this uh, predictions? Is that, yeah, because we train a lot of the data and all that. And, you know, how, and then I said, how can you improve yourself? Then the question he said that, uh, if you can help me locate John Connor, I'll be happy. So for those who, who know what who John Connor is, it's the Terminator. <laughs> so um, you call 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 Chat PhD a pretty smart ass himself, but uh, but one that that is happening right now as we speak. So um, so the there's no easy question. Um, it I would say um, a lot of these uh, efforts are already done. So one of the great thing that um, that OpenAI is doing um, behind the Chat GPT. One of the initiatives is not just create this uh, huge, this smart, intelligent chatbot, 
they actually have a they have this called alignment uh, called general artificial intelligence. The whole idea is that how do you kind of create this non biases when you train this model? Because data, you know, what we call a garbage in, garbage out. So if you have this kind of biases that kind of come in and say, you know, um, something that you should sway one person towards a different opinion, then become your parameter or the controlling factor of determining what the outcome is going to be. So, um, so that's the idea where you actually a lot of things that can be done even before you create this AI model. So, um, of course, there's deep fake and all that things right now. Um, that's already too late. Things can already generate these things. But the idea is that there's can also, you know, you can write another AI algorithm or chatbot to detect this is a fake, you know, message. That's also something that you can do also. So basically, so the countermeasure, if you will, towards those things. So um, I think there are multiple fronts that we could tackle this problem. Uh, of course, we're very concerned about this. Um, but I think this is actually some of the idea where they create new opportunities um, that I think, um, you know, allow us to have more innovations. And I think uh, going back to the chat GPT, this is exactly what they're starting off with. Now, how far they are with, we don't know because they're still owned by this a private company. Um, but I think um, we're seeing some great initiatives that are coming out from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in, I was just gonna make a quick comment. I mean, I think I, I would say, you know, those of us that are up here talking, we we tend to be out on the the front edge. We tend to be the optimists. There are, in many cases, uh, an other side to this, and you know, I think countermeasure or just understanding what the the other side is is the first step toward then figuring out how to make sure you can properly balance it because that that is the challenge we're not you know i've been uh, one of those on privacy has been a big topic for a while uh, most consumers as an example are not really willing to go have a greatly degraded experience like going to a duckduckgo search engine versus google uh, because of privacy it's just not and so you have to figure out how to protect people's information, which leads to a new way to think about how do you authenticate that somebody is truly who they say they are, but the information's not going to, that's out there is not going to go back in the bottle, as I often say. Um, we, we just have to think creatively and in new ways about how do we help protect people in this new reality where you can do deep fakes and, and other things. So it's... It, it is a challenge for sure. Um, it will lead to new ways to do authentication and validation, probably some things like data sovereignty and ownership and a lot of those questions that are being wrestled with right now. All those are innovation opportunities, I guess, is, is the optimistic way that I, I tend to look at it. Yeah, let, let, let me add on to that. So uh, I, I've been in the healthcare space for 25 plus years. So my area of competency is AI programming. I've created six AI products in the past, uh, three virtual avatars. So I, I know this space really well. So one, one area is in healthcare, physicians and clinicians uh, want to do more shared decision making. So they look at AI as more of an assistant and a companion. Right. So from a uh, psychological perspective and a, a and a comfort level perspective, that's how they look at it. Uh, the other tools that are uh, that are in this space are called AI explainability tools. Mm -hmm. So AI explainability tools pretty much logs, you know, what's going on with your algorithm and saying, OK, how did it make its decision? Right. And it explains it removes the black box concept. On, on the AI side. So it shows on the log, say, hey, you know, if you ask the question, how did the AI come about making that particular recommendation? So that's called AI explainability tools. And then the other set of tools are called what I call um, um, uh, algorithmic governance tools. So, the, so you have self-learning AI algorithms out there as well. And these self-learning tools, if you don't monitor them and actually see how they're learning, you don't you actually don't know what's going on <laughs> so there are now tools that are on the governance side to mo to um uh, to look at how algorithms actually learn and log those learnings and see whether there are new patterns coming out that the ai is self-learning from as opposed to it it being taught right so chat gpt is a self-learning system because it has a feedback mechanism 
I, I can guarantee you there's probably a governance tool component in there that actually tracks all that. Great. Um, just, uh, oh, there's, there's a question. Oh, hold on. Let me pass the microphone so you get it. Everybody can hear you globally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, in terms of AI, what are your thoughts on regulatory pushback in the short term, intermediate term, and long long term? And I guess we could add quantum computing to that as well. So I, I'll take this. Um, so I think uh, we actually kind of alluded that early on. The mint, the first kind of like. Uh, question or challenge is like, what about the data privacy, particularly from a healthcare perspective? You know, um, this is not just some general internet data you can kind of scrape from the from the whole internet. This is like personal data from, from, uh, from patients, right? So that's probably the really the first regulation challenges, you know, that is coming out, I would say immediately. Um, and like I said, I think one of the opportunity, if you will, is like, well, you know, all this data, you know, who owns that data? And so this is actually an opportunity. So we all see that the, the model or the algorithm itself is sort of like become a commodity, if you will. The really kind of value is where you get the data from. So I think ChatGPT is powerful because they basically scrape the entire internet every digital publications, any poems, anything that is in digital form, they just kind of do that. And it's available free, they would do it, right? So they can actually build up this powerful model. But ChatGPT cannot go behind, you know, where, where do I get your uh, MRI data? I want to get your electronic health records. They can't do that. But who owns those that records? Potentially it's the hospitals, you know, because they would actually have that data. And if they can actually, it's a great, um, you know, because of the regulation challenge potential. So now in that case, what if I can actually, you know, from I can license ChatGPT's technology and then build that technology on the data model that, you know, that owned by the appropriate, you know, owners, you know, let's say the hospitals or clinics and all that, or maybe they can get consent from the individual patients because, you know, well, I, I go to see this doctor, doctor asked me, can I use your data? And I say, yes, I can. Then, you know, that becomes sort of like a, um, a great opportunity. And it's actually a good opportunity for ChatGPT. So it's a, more like a license opportunity. So now then you can get the government regulation, you know, everything buy in and then create a, that's why, you know, that's, um, you know, there's a, if you read the latest news, uh, Microsoft is considering putting $10 billion into this company. Um, so with minimum revenue, we heard that story before, but you know, we see how it goes this time. Yeah, it's actually connected. It's connected to the Bing, so, so yes. they're going to try to connect the the chat, uh, chat GTP to Bing. So it's a, it's an interesting thing.